Welcome to Dalhousie Medical School. We're going to review the 140 years of history of this medical school as it enters a new century and a new process of educating physicians. Dalhousie University was founded in 1818 by the Lieutenant Governor, the Earl of Dalhousie, who used the Castine Fund to establish a university based on Edinburgh. The first Dalhousie College was in the Grand Parade and the building on the left sits where the current City Hall now resides. There was no teaching of medicine at the time, it was mostly arts and science. And for the first years the college actually didn't operate until Thomas McCullough came from Picto Academy to become the first president. Discussions about a medical school did begin some years later, but they came to naught until Charles Tupper argued on the board of Dalhousie that it was too expensive for medical students from the Maritimes to go abroad or go to Philadelphia, New York, to become physicians. And he wanted a medical school established at Dalhousie to serve the Maritime provinces. He was then a politician and a premier of Nova Scotia and realized that there had to be an anatomy act allowing dissection of bodies for a medical school to actually begin. There had been a number of meetings that came to naught as they didn't think they had enough resources and there was initially no anatomy act. But they met in December 1867, a small group of local men at a physician's house to talk about a new medical school and at that meeting they referred to themselves as the faculty and as a result people often talk about Dalhousie Medical School beginning in December 1867 but in fact the medical school was formally established in 1868 they applied to the board of Dalhousie and the board who were not enthusiastic about the idea of a medical school knowing that it would be a very expensive venture for the university did agree, however, and said, the board does not feel justified in refusing the offer of the gentleman who proposed to form a medical faculty in connection with Dalhousie University. And the faculty, being ready and desirous of receiving students in the ensuing spring, the board saw no sufficient reason for postponing further action on the matter. Now, it is clear that they weren't very enthusiastic by that published memo, but the medical school was then established. And as you enter the Tupper building, you'll see a plaque on the wall, and it has the names of the first faculty of the medical school. They were all graduates of Edinburgh Medical School, except for Dr. Allman, who was a graduate of Glasgow Medical School in Scotland. They assigned each other the different tasks in the medical school, who would be professor of what particular area, and Alexander Reed was made the first dean of the faculty. Now it's interesting to note that from that first meeting at a physician's house to the application to the board, advertising for medical students and beginning the first class of medical students took only three months. Charles Tupper was not on the first faculty, but he was responsible really for the establishment of the medical school by advocating the importance and establishing the Anatomy Act. So it is, I think, appropriate that the new medical school was named after him. A.P. Reed, the first dean, a very visionary and a brilliant man, and he remained as dean for the first decades of the medical school. This is the handwritten announcement indicating that they were established as a medical school, would take in students. It indicated that the fees for a class would be $6, a demonstrator's ticket was $4, and matriculation fee of $1. Fees uh, have gone up since then. And they were given one room in Dalhousie College in the Grand Parade and that room was used for teaching the medical students and the unventilated attic was used for dissection. And this is a picture of the first class at Dalhousie. Uh, these students applied to begin medical school and within the three months of establishing they arrived and began to take classes. It's also interesting to note that the the idea of the medical school initially was not to graduate physicians, it was to give them the first two years of a four-year training, and that would be 
a major saving in terms of their cost of completing their training for medicine. It was expected that the students would go off for their last two years to Philadelphia and London and Edinburgh as before. However, within the first two years, that group were told that they could continue if they wished, and five of them did. So five stayed for the full four years at Dalhousie, and that first graduating class in 1872 had five graduates. They taught medicine in the Dalhousie College for the next decade and established what they thought was a good medical school training good physicians for the maritime provinces. Clinical training was at the city and provincial hospital, which was later renamed the Victoria General Hospital, and also at the Halifax Dispensary and other hospitals around the city. Everything was going smoothly until 1885, when a row broke out between the faculty at the medical school and the board overseeing the hospital. There was one position available for a resident house surgeon and two applicants came forward. One was Dr. Goodwin, who was a graduate of Dalhousie. He was from St. John, New Brunswick. The other was Dr. Hawkins, who was from Halifax but went to McGill Medical School. They both applied the board of the hospital, however, made it clear that they wanted a Halifax lad to take the position. That meant Hawkins, who was not a graduate of Dalhousie, but of McGill. Finally, in the discussion between the faculty and the board, they said, well, we'll set an examination. Now, Goodwin from Dalhousie made a mark of 80% on the exam, but Hawkins made only 66. Despite that, the Committee on Public Charities that oversaw the hospital recommended Hawkins for the position. The medical staff were outraged and they resigned. Not only did, did they resign, they stayed out for the next two years. The medical school then had to close because it had no major clinical teaching hospital to train their medical students. At that point, they established an independent medical school. Now, you remember they were initially a faculty of Dalhousie. Now they're an independent Halifax Medical College. The relationship with Dalhousie is a bit peculiar because although they were an independent school that taught the medical students independently, those students at the end would apply to write the exams at Dalhousie and then receive a Dalhousie degree. Here's a picture of the old Halifax Medical College with its faculty at that point. They thought, that, again, they were running a very effective medical school, training very good physicians, and things seemed to be going well. Because they were independent, they could now apply for grants from government, like any other institution, which they weren't allowed to do when they were a faculty. Another very interesting aspect of that era is the presence of women in the medical school. Now you have to note that in the 1880s, most medical schools in the world, including Edinburgh, London, Philadelphia, did not accept women as medical students. Despite that, the faculty at a meeting at Dalhousie, they had not any applicants, but they made a motion which passed unanimously to encourage women to apply to medicine very unusual stance when no other medical schools at the time were accepting women. But the first woman to apply was Annie Hamilton, who applied in 1889. She took a year out because of cost and graduated in 1894, then the first woman graduate of Dalhousie Medical School. Now Annie Hamilton, shown here uh, as a medical student and on the left in her Chinese costume because she went after graduation to Shanghai as a medical missionary and spent her life there. Her birthplace outside Truro is shown in the upper left just at the time it was about to be demolished. So she had a distinguished career as a medical missionary but after that point when she graduated you see her here in the midst of her fellow male medical students 